Uh, let me ask first off if anyone has any questions from last week or the readings uh, for this week. It may be uh, I'm going to be sure to cover it, in which case I'll tell you uh, we'll get to, the, uh, get to it a little later. But uh, otherwise, uh, fire away. Who should I answer first? Yes. There was one comment in the book where it talked about, if I remember correctly, I may be mistaken, but where the Tennessee Valley projects yeah. were not necessary. Is that correct? Uh, it was not economically uh, necessary, at least as. Uh, as developed at the time, uh, it was done to help uh, provide employment. Right. Yeah. Why? I didn't understand. I couldn't figure in grasp why that was because it was my understanding that those were some of the those those jobs felt to push the economy to get it done. Well, the test of whether or not something is uh, economically necessary is uh, whether or not it's profitable. And uh, any time uh, the government is involved, it, it appears necessary that the government do something. Uh, it's almost inevitable that uh, private enterprise has found the, the project unprofitable and uh, rejects it for that reason. Now, uh, who knows, maybe uh, something similar to TVA could have been uh, done privately uh, had the electric power facilities uh, been put up uh, for private ownership, had, had, they, had they allowed private firms to uh, participate in the project from the beginning. I don't know. Yes? Uh, in that way, would you say the same for the New Deal? Yeah, well, the TVA was uh, a showcase uh, aspect of the New Deal. Okay, so, yeah. so in that, because the argument is the opposite, says that that is the stimulus, that that creates a, a job pool, and it certainly creates a, a demand set. Yeah, okay, one of the things that I hope to show, maybe even tonight, I would like to show it tonight, uh, is that uh, in fact, uh, we do not have to create jobs. Uh, there's more work out there waiting to be done than we're capable of doing. And when you have a problem of mass unemployment, it's because of some artificial, unnecessary impediment uh, to people doing some larger fraction of the work that is out there waiting to be done. Uh, here I have a topic, scarcity, uh, and then the ineradicability of scarcity, uh, point three, and uh, that it's not eliminated by more workers. Uh, you see, uh, this goes uh, to the question of what is the extent of our desire for wealth? What's the extent of our desire for goods and services? Uh, th pardon me? Limitless. It's limitless. Uh, just think whatever your income is now, would you have any great difficulty in living up to twice the income? No. And if it got to be twice the income, would you have a difficulty in living up to twice that? Now here's uh, Bill Gates, uh, who not so long ago was reportedly worth uh, $40 billion plus. Uh, does he have enough wealth uh, to satisfy every goal and project that he's interested in achieving? Not at all. Now what is the essential requisite for the production of all wealth and the rendition of all services? What's the one essential item that's always needed? Yes? What do we need to produce anything or provide any service? What's the, yes, and you are? Resources. Pardon? Uh, the natural resources. Yeah, and your name is? Okay, now you say we need the natural resources. Okay, we have natural resources. What do we have to do to get them out of the ground? We have to apply labor. Right. We have to apply labor. And one of the things uh, I also hope to show is that uh, there's always more natural resources, or virtually always, uh, more natural resources around 
uh, than we're able at any given time economically to exploit. So for example, uh, do we uh, farm every acre that is capable of growing crops? No. Do we farm the acres that we do farm to the utmost limit of their possible output? Well, if you applied more labor and capital to the same plot of ground, you would almost always get additional output. But we don't apply uh, the labor and capital uh, to the utmost limit. Let me uh, jump to that right now. No reason why we have to follow uh, a definite order. Here I have a classic illustration of the law of diminishing returns. All right, here we are. This is a table in my book. And this is a kind of illustration you'd find in hundreds of textbooks uh, going back generations. Uh, we assume we have a piece of land of some definite amount, like a farm of 100 acres. And here we are. We could apply a one man year uh, to this farm, and we get a certain output, like 100 bushels. Uh, if we apply two man years, we would get a larger output, but uh, typically less than double. Now, these, this is for illustration only. Thank you. Uh, it might be you'd have an a case uh, you apply double the labor, you get more than double the output. But then if what will happen if we redouble the labor? Could we go on uh, doubling and redoubling the labor applied to the same land and always getting proportionate results or greater than proportionate results? No, at some point we get diminishing returns. Now, let's say they begin right away with the second man year. Now, already at this point, uh, if we had two man years available, uh, would it be a, a wise thing to do to employ two man years on this one uh, parcel of land, or if we had a second equally good parcel of land available, uh, to apply the second man year to that second parcel? Uh, does this uh, stop anyone from seeing uh, having doused that light? Yeah. Which would be more desirable, to have uh, two man years on two parcels or on one parcel? Two on two parcels. With two parcels, we would get a total output of 200 instead of 100. But now, if we have uh, sufficient land so that we don't have to employ so much labor down to the point where, let's say, the eighth worker uh, yields nothing extra, uh, here we are, we're uh, assuming the incremental output keeps diminishing by 10 for the sake of illustration. Well, maybe with a fifth worker, it would be 60, uh, a sixth worker, 50. Uh, would it be economical uh, just because we might employ 10 man years on this one parcel of land to do so? Not if we have additional land available. And if we are not at the absolute limit of output on a piece of land, then it's always possible to expand the output what would be required to expand the output from the land we already work? Just more labor. More labor uh, can certainly increase the supply of practically any agricultural product. And the same is true in mining. Uh, we do not exploit every mine uh, to uh, the point where the application of additional labor yields nothing at all. Uh, we typically cut off the exploitation of a mine at a point uh, far, far short of the absolute limit of its productivity. An excellent illustration is the case of, of a typical uh, oil field. Um, uh, typically, the amount of oil that is extracted from a field uh, only amounts to roughly one-third of the oil that's physically down there. Now, it's possible to get uh, a third one-sixth bring it up from a third to a half, but that third one-sixth uh, is uh, substantially more expensive per unit than the first two-sixths. Why? Because you have to adopt uh, more sophisticated methods. Uh, you have to uh, 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 flood the, uh, the, the field or uh, inject chemicals, uh, possibly start a fire underground. Uh, it takes a lot more uh, to get that third one-sixth. If the price of oil is high enough, we do it. But uh, typically, if the oil wells, if the oil fields are there, 
uh, it's more economical uh, to employ uh, uh, three fields, uh, each to the extent of one third, than uh, two fields to the extent of half. Uh, now, why would this be so? Well, with the same labor applied to three fields uh, rather than uh, uh, concentrated on two, we get a greater output. The same labor here, we have, it's, the principle is right up here. If we have two man years, two man years applied to two parcels of land produce more than two man years applied to one parcel of land. Very similarly, uh, the same amount of labor applied in oil production or extraction of uh, crude oil uh, will produce more crude oil uh, when it's applied uh, to the extent of only getting a third of the output out of three fields rather than a half of the output out of two. And uh, similar uh, uh, principles apply uh, in iron mining, uh, sulfur mining, uh, just about anything. So it is possible uh, to step up the production of virtually any mineral from uh, already known and exploited deposits uh, by exploiting them more intensively. And then beyond that, uh, there's always land and deposits which we know about but don't exploit at all because the yield would be too low. And this is also very closely related uh, to diminishing returns. You can view it as another aspect of diminishing returns. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to have to bite the bullet here and uh, get back the outline. Um, I have a reference here uh, right under the heading of Law of Diminishing Returns uh, following the uh, illustration I just gave you. Uh, Ricardo and grades of land of decreasing quality. Now, here we are. We have uh, the, the same sort of illustration uh, as I just gave you. Here it is. I think this is pretty much the same illustration carried one step further. Can you guys see this in the back? Okay. Now, uh, in the case of agricultural land and mines, uh, there are uh, lands and mines of different degrees of quality, different degrees of productivity. Uh, as far as we're aware of these differences, uh, which do you think we want to exploit first? Which would you rather exploit uh, if you were a mining company, a uh, more productive mine uh, that can be operated at a lower cost, or a less productive mine that requires a higher cost? or if you're in farming, a more productive farm uh, that produces at a lower cost, or a less productive one that produces at a higher cost. I would say, obviously, the more productive. So as far as people are aware of differences and have the ability to choose, uh, they choose to exploit uh, the most productive sources first. So uh, people would prefer to produce on land of the first quality, that's the most productive, uh, where the output of the same labor is 100. And then uh, only when all the land of the first or best quality had been brought under cultivation would they turn to land of the second quality, where the output is 90. And until all of the land of the second quality were under cultivation, uh, no one would bother to farm land of the third or fourth quality. Uh, and. Uh, the same applies to uh, mining. Uh, why uh, has only recently uh, the, uh, the tar sands up in Alberta uh, come under uh, heavy exploitation uh, for their oil? You know, there's oil found in Alberta uh, in the form of tar sands, uh, but it's apparently not profitable to extract oil from these tar sands unless the price of petroleum is above $30 a barrel, which it has been now for a little while. Uh, but it would not pay at uh, $25 a barrel. So if the price of oil were $25 a barrel, uh, would such uh, high-cost uh, petroleum deposits be exploited? No, they'd be left idle. 
Now, uh, there are always uh, such deposits that we know about that could be exploited or uh, deposits that we are exploiting that could be exploited more intensively, but uh, it's an issue of the, the cost of doing it versus the price of the product. But uh, the implication is that uh, even in the case of minerals, uh, there is hardly any mineral whose production we could not step up in fairly short order uh, from uh, already known sources. Now, what would be what would be required to step up the production? What would be the fundamental element that we would have to apply uh, more heavily? Labor. Essentially, it would be labor. Uh, it's labor directly uh, on the sp on the land or the, the in the mine, and more labor uh, to produce whatever tools or materials might be required uh, in exploiting the land. So, uh, the limiting element uh, is really labor. And uh, there is virtually no limit to how much uh, overall products and services we'd like to have. So you just think of it this way. Uh, we'd all like to be able to have double the income. We wouldn't have any difficulty figuring out how to spend double the income. But uh, what would be the limiting element uh, required to produce uh, double the actual goods and services? It would be labor. Uh, the implication is there's really a fundamental scarcity of labor. Labor is the underlying fundamental scarce element. And that's why, see, I'm, uh, uh, perhaps uh, jumping ahead here, uh, on the one side, we have a virtually limitless desire and need for wealth. On the other side, the fundamentally limiting factor in our ability to produce it is human labor. And labor uh, is always limited. Uh, just think, uh, at any given time, there are only so many people able to work. They have a limited capacity to work, and they don't want to work to their capacity. They also want to have leisure. So what is the basic uh, solution to this problem of having an unlimited need and desire for the products of labor, but limited labor to produce those products. What do we have to do to get more and more products and services from the same labor? This is where I was having a little bit of trouble with connecting. There are two examples of countries that I've been in that have a surplus of talent mm -hmm. within what we call the middle class. And it seems to me as though it's a labor class that's yet to be packed in. We have both of these, I'm thinking Brazil and Morocco. Yeah. We have two very educated middle classes in yeah. these countries, yet they both have a tremendously high level of unemployment to mm -hmm. talent. Yeah. And subsequently have extremely challenged economy. Mm -hmm. The only sense that I can make of this was that using the New Zealand as an example, that it's an, it's almost the question seems to be, but the answer seems to be the institutionalized discipline, right, to create a opportunity set, to create a pathway to deploy this labor against. Because in a lazy and fair hands off, this is what happened. They said and they're very well educated and they don't have jobs to go. Okay, you say that uh, you're familiar with Brazil and Morocco and they have uh, substantial unemployment and they have uh, an educated class and then there's a mass of uh, uneducated people, many of whom are unemployed, and uh, you think that what is necessary to solve that problem is some type of New Deal arrangement, and that what they now have is a kind of laissez-faire arrangement, uh, which explains uh, why they're mired in the situation they're in. I'd probably describe it a little broadly. I wouldn't say that they have, I wouldn't attribute it to laissez-faire. I'd, I'd attribute it to the fact that there has been no defined discipline system that would create opportunities to employ the talent. You say no defined discipline. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't think I understand what that means. I would say that uh, what their underlying problem there is that uh, uh, people cannot uh, produce, uh, they cannot inaugurate uh, significant production projects uh, with any kind of uh, security for property rights. Uh, you have in these places uh, as a minimum, extremely corrupt governance, uh, if not worse. And uh, what is required to uh, uh, launch any kind of significant project and employ any significant number of people? What would you have to do to be able to do that? Could you 
uh, just uh, open up a business and offer jobs to people? Or do you think uh, you'd first need all kinds of approvals and permissions and take on all kinds of governmental partners? Uh, that's why uh, they're paralyzed. Uh, the incentive uh, to conduct these projects uh, that would employ uh, substantial numbers of people and eliminate this problem, uh, that is uh, is aborted. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Is, I'm sorry, is it fair? To say that the division of labor in the, such countries is not developed? The division of labor, is it fair to say the division of labor in those countries is not developed? I would say it's uneven. Uh, it would depend on what part you were talking about. Uh, there are parts of Brazil that are fully integrated into the division of labor. Uh, the city of Sao Paulo and its uh, surroundings, uh, probably Rio de Janeiro and, and other areas. Uh, uh, there are probably other parts in the interior that are not very well integrated. Uh, I suspect Morocco has less integration than uh, Brazil. But uh, you see, uh, just compare uh, the degree of needs and wants in those countries uh, with their ability to satisfy those needs and wants. Now, uh, it may be that uh, a factor that contributes to their unemployment is that uh, their productivity of labor is so miserably low uh, they produce so little per capita that it might be economical uh, to employ such people only at uh, wages too low for them to live at. But uh, there is a need for their labor. Uh, the problem is it's really not sufficiently productive uh, to make it possible to, to employ too many of them. Can I continue? Yeah, okay. major attribute is systemic in the sense that the corruption of it, right? Well, that's a leading part of it. Uh, the lack, I would say, the lack of respect for property rights, the lack of a clear rule of law, uh, and whatever uh, problems there are in the culture that perpetuate that. So in a, in a pure hands-off capitalist approach, mm -hmm. how do you counter something that clearly needs to be broken? How would it be countered? Well, I would say uh, the way it's being countered right now, uh, without a fully capitalist approach, but one that's uh, substantially moving in that direction, uh, in important provinces of China. Uh, when uh, China uh, opened its economy, or parts of its economy at any rate, uh, to the rest of the world, uh, what, what has happened? I mean, here you are, you have uh, tens and hundreds of millions of uh, uh, people able and willing to work, and uh, they start off at uh, miserably low wages. Uh, what opportunity does that uh, provide uh, to businessmen elsewhere in the world? And to come in and take advantage of that, and as they do, uh, what happens to the demand for labor? It goes up. Uh, what happens to wage rates? That goes up. And what happens to the ability of uh, local Chinese or whoever might be in the country, uh, what, as uh, their incomes go up and as they uh, see opportunities of an entrepreneurial nature, uh, what happens uh, to, to their ability to save and accumulate capital? That goes up. Now, uh, what would have happened had, instead of uh, Deng Xiaoping, I think his name was, Instead of uh, uh, him becoming the uh, head of China in the early 1980s, uh, suppose uh, someone in the exact same mold as Mao Zedong had uh, uh, assumed the leadership and continued the same policies as Mao. Uh, what difference do you think that would have made to the Chinese economy? I would say they'd be back where they were uh, under Mao. But uh, freeing up the economy, even to the extent it has been freed up, uh, has uh, brought about incredible progress. Now, they still have a very, very long way to go. But if they were to continue the progress they've had for the last 20 years at the same rate for the next 20, 30, or 40 years, then uh, China, at the end of that period, uh, would be at a level, the same kind of level as Japan, and close to, if not ahead of the United States. 
So uh, that's uh, essentially what they need. And uh, it is uh, uh, the closer uh, to laissez-faire uh, understood as uh, the government uh, providing uh, protection of property rights, clearly defining property rights, enforcing them, and letting people free uh, to pursue their self-interest within the framework of uh, clear legal norms respecting individual rights, including property rights, uh, that sets things going. And uh, there is this uh, scarcity of labor. Uh, uh, on the one side, there's a limited capacity to work. On the other side, there's a limitless need and desire for wealth. The key thing is to raise the output per unit of labor. The fundamental economic problem is how do we raise the output per unit of labor? And what do you think the basic answer to that question is in terms of the necessary framework? What framework has to exist economically uh, to uh, create the, the ability to achieve a high and rising productivity of labor? Division the division of labor. The division of labor and what the division of labor depends on, uh, which I, I uh, began pointing out last week, is the institutions of capitalism. And so um, that is really the, the, the key, uh, raising the, uh, the productivity of labor. And we need the division of labor and all that's necessary to it. Above all, private ownership of the means of production and uh, respect for property rights. All right, so here we are. We've, uh, our first major topic has turned out to be the law of diminishing returns. And before leaving it, I hope you'll uh, absorb this statement of the law. Uh, you see, in order to produce anything, as a minimum, we need at least two factors of production. Uh, a factor of production uh, is anything physically required to produce a product. Uh, labor and land are the most elementary factors. Uh, uh, anything previously produced, any sort of tool or material, uh, that uh, uh, represents further factors of production. Uh, um, in making uh, computers, uh, the factors of production would include uh, all the different types of labor required, uh, the various uh, materials. If we're inside a computer factory, uh, there the starting point would be uh, pre-existing uh, computer chips, uh, perhaps motherboards. Like for Dell, uh, factories of production are motherboards, uh, computer cases, uh, memory chips, hard drives, and uh, the various types of labor uh, that they require. And of course, the uh, assembly facility, the factory building, whatever equipment they'd be using, all of that would represent uh, the factories of production uh, to require, uh, required to produce Dell's uh, computer computers. Now, uh, where the uh, law of diminishing returns comes in uh, is in connection with the fact that uh, very, very often it is possible uh, to increase the output of a product without increasing all of the necessary factors of production. If you did increase all of the necessary factors, you should expect uh, to be able to increase the output in proportion. If we have uh, two factories of the same kind instead of one, uh, each uh, with the same equipment, we have twice the total equipment uh, in the uh, two factories. If we had twice the uh, requisite types of workers and uh, previously produced components and so forth, uh, we should expect to produce twice uh, the number of computers. But very, very often, it's possible to produce more output without increasing all of the necessary factors. We might hold some of the factors constant. Uh, typically, uh, the factory building, if it's not operating at capacity, uh, you can expand output from the same factory building. Uh, you may only need to add additional labor and materials. Uh, you can expand the output very often from the same uh, facility and equipment. But uh, can you go on expanding the output at a constant rate? Would you be able, just by increasing some of the factors, uh, to uh, 
keep expanding the output uh, proportionately. You'll reach a plateau. Well, would you stay at a plateau? Like, would it be the case that uh, here we are, let's say we have uh, 100 uh, assembly stations in the Dell facility, and presently uh, 60 of them are uh, being utilized. Uh, we could bring on uh, the requisite workers and uh, components and so forth uh, to fill the remaining 40, uh, and we might, uh, in this example, get uh, two-thirds more output. But could we bring on 50 workers? We'd have uh, too much labor relative to the same uh, facilities. We'd then need to have more uh, facilities. Now, uh, there are cases, uh, uh, sometimes, uh, in order to produce more, you have to expand uh, all of the factors right away. Uh, a clear example of that would be, suppose you wanted to produce uh, cloth dyed to a definite shade. Suppose you wanted to produce uh, cloth dyed to some uh, shade of purple, and it's precise shade. Well, what will happen if you apply more of the dye to the same amount of cloth? It'll be darker, darker than you wanted it. It will be defeating your objective, right? That won't be what you wanted to achieve. Uh, the extra dye, the application of the extra dye would be counterproductive. It would not achieve your productive goal. What would you need in order for that extra dye uh, to be helpful? Wow. You need proportionally more cloth. This is a case of fixed proportions. Now, there are many, many cases where you have to use the inputs in fixed proportions. But there are other cases in which you can hold some of the inputs fixed and just increase certain of the other inputs. And that illustration I gave a little while ago with a farm of 100 acres and different amounts of man years, well, that's uh, a classic illustration. With the same land, uh, we could get more output uh, up to a point. We get diminishing increments beyond a point. Uh, with the same mines, the same thing. And again and again, uh, there are industrial type examples. Uh, suppose uh, we have a flatbed truck. Uh, if we want to have more cargo, uh, do we right away need uh, another truck? No, the same truck uh, can haul a variable amount of cargo. You could have cargo one layer high, or you can have it two layers high, perhaps three. But uh, notice, uh, even at this level, uh, what greater difficulty do you have? It takes longer to get the stuff out of the truck. Well, it takes a little bit longer to put it up and take it down. You have to lift it higher, and then uh, you'll have to secure the cargo uh, more firmly. But there's going to be a point where, uh, if you want to haul more cargo, you're going to need another truck. Uh, there's diminishing returns here. You have some variability in how much you can get from the same uh, unit, but uh, it's not, uh, at some point it starts diminishing. And uh, so diminishing returns uh, exist uh, to whatever extent uh, we're producing physical things and you need uh, the different inputs. Uh, if anything is really physically necessary to the output, sooner or later, uh, more of it will either be absolutely essential or, as a minimum, uh, helpful. Uh, uh, to produce more and more crops, in our example, uh, more land would be helpful by the time we got to the second man year. At some point, it would be absolutely essential uh, if you exhausted uh, what could be produced from a given parcel. So. Uh, anytime anything is physically necessary, we're going to need more of it sooner or later, or there'll be an advantage to having more of it. And uh, there's also this closely related element of uh, uh, there being different lands and uh, mines of different degrees of fertility. And uh, since we prefer the most productive first, uh, that means that other things being equal, only less productive ones will remain for later or for uh, further exploitation. So that's a second reason why, uh, as we would expand the output, uh, there would be diminishing returns. And uh, both of these points, uh, I say basis of the law, well, physical quantitative definiteness, that means we can only get so much service from any given physical thing. If we're baking bread, uh, we're going to need more flour pretty fast. Uh, 
ultimately we need more ovens and more bakeries. And then there's this uh, further element, uh, the operation of rational self-interest, which leads us to choose the most productive uses of a factor of production first. We'd want to use the most productive uses of labor first. That means applying it to the best grades of land. But uh, if we've used up, if we're fully exploiting the best grades, then only lesser grades remain. All right, let me pause here uh, and ask if we have any, any questions pertaining to diminishing returns. Okay. If any occur to you as we proceed, uh, feel free to raise them. Uh, let me jump back now to the beginning. Uh, our broader subject of discussion is uh, wealth and the economic problem. And I've already indicated the fundamental economic problem. It's how to raise the productivity of labor, how to go on raising the productivity of labor, which is the fundamental scarce element in production in the face of a need and desire for wealth that has no fixed limit. That's the fundamental economic problem. The fundamental solution is a division of labor, capitalist economy. That's uh, the basic uh, framework uh, of continually solving the economic problem that's never solved with finality. And we always want to raise the productivity of labor still higher, because we can always use still more wealth. Yes. Uh, Okay. Uh, All right. Talked about the diminishing returns. Yeah. Does it apply to diminishing of labor too? No. How far it can go? Diminishing of labor. Okay. Does diminishing returns apply to the division of labor as a, an institution? That's a very good question, uh, and I would say uh, no, it does not. Uh, diminishing returns applies to uh, physical factors of production. Uh, it applies to. Uh, 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 land sites, uh, factory buildings, machines, tools, uh, to labor at any given time. But let me try to explain uh, how the division of labor is something that, uh, by its nature, works to offset diminishing returns and enable us uh, to escape uh, from its operation. And I think I may have indicated this a little bit le uh, two weeks ago. Uh, did I have a discussion of a medical school example? Uh, pardon me? Yeah, okay. All right. The basic point of that was that as we have a larger uh, cooperating population, what happens to the absolute size of the smallest specializations if they're organized into a division of labor? See, if we didn't have a division of labor, suppose we did not have a division of labor society and our population were growing. Okay, now, uh, people have already uh, chosen the best, most productive lands as far as they're aware. Uh, they're exploiting the best, most productive mines as far as they're aware. Now there's more people. Uh, where will the extra people have to go if we don't have a division of labor society? Where do they go when there's a higher population in a third world country? Suppose here you are, uh, you have a father, he owns uh, some little farm, and the father has uh, not one son, but two, three, or four. Now, in some countries, they have an institution, like in Great Britain, they had an institution known as primogeniture, which meant that the eldest son got everything. But then what happened to the other three or two? Well, tough luck. Uh, one of them might have been, if they were uh, a fairly wealthy family, uh, one of them might have uh, joined the army or navy as an officer. Uh, another might have become a clergyman. Uh, and if they weren't uh, at that status, then uh, they're out in among the masses uh, trying to scratch the barest possible living. In many other places, I believe in China in the past, uh, the land would just be continually subdivided. So now we had the father with one decent sized plot. Now there are two or three sons uh, having to form a half or a third. Well, what do you think happens uh, to their output per capita? It's obviously down. And 
what do you think that does uh, to the number of people who can survive? What does it do uh, to their state of health and, and general well-being, nutrition? It reduces it. And so can you see any kind of natural check uh, to population in such circumstances? Well, the, the people are more poorly nourished, right? What happens if they have a bad year and the crops come in below normal? They have a famine. And if people are weakened uh, from lack of proper nutrition, what happens to their susceptibility to disease? That goes up, and, and you have the stage set uh, for plagues, which were part of the uh, regular history of mankind. Famine, recurring famines and plagues uh, were uh, part of the history of mankind until very, very recently, and in some parts of the world still are, or would be in the absence of uh, Western aid, uh, down to uh, perhaps the uh, 18th century. Uh, this was a recurring pattern. And that's what served always to limit population. You'd have diminishing returns to people in non-division of labor societies. They'd run up against the uh, limitation of the available land and uh, natural resources. And uh, they'd hit a stone wall that would uh, periodically wipe out large numbers of human beings. Now, the, only when uh, the division of labor began to take hold uh, could this change? And a division of labor represents our foremost security against this sort of thing. Because in a division of labor society, when we have more people, does this mean that we have to have people uh, having to start farms higher up the hillsides, into the mountains, down into the swamps, uh, subdivide the parcels of land? Uh, when we have more people, we have more people going into uh, the different branches of the division of labor. And a major uh, subset of these branches uh, are the branches concerned with the acquisition and application of new knowledge. All of the uh, branches of science, engineering, and also business. Business is very closely connected with science and engineering. Uh, business firms are uh, seeking to set scientists and engineers to work, solving definite problems. They're interested in what the scientists and engineers are accomplishing on their own, if they have any possible uh, commercial exploitation value. And so uh, business is fostering uh, scientific and technological development. And as that occurs, what is the effect on the productivity of labor? It raises it. Now, uh, we still have diminishing returns, but because of scientific and technological progress made possible by the framework of a division of labor. So you just think, uh, in that doctor example, the medical school example, I gave you an example. We had a population of four million people, which by various assumptions, could support one reasonably efficient sized medical school that would ultimately have 4,000 practicing physicians, but only four of them might be brain specialists or some other specialization. Uh, what happens if we have a society instead of 4 million, 400 million with the same ratios? What does that do to the absolute number of these specialists, in this case, the brain specialists? We have 400 instead of four. Now, the same point would apply uh, to all of the different branches of engineering and science. Now, if you have a larger absolute number of intelligent, motivated people, what and they're working in these uh, areas of specialization. They're working on various branches of science, mathematics, uh, engineering, and business innovation. What is the likelihood of successful innovations? It's much higher. And what will be the effect of that on the productivity of labor? It'll go up. There'll be new methods of production, new types of machines, uh, new abilities of all kinds to do things. And that operates to offset uh, the law of diminishing returns. And uh, the way I illustrate it, here we are. This is our initial situation. Uh, that's, let's say that's where we stood in uh, 1804 or 1904. Now, uh, I, okay, that the above was 1904. Now, because of uh, tremendous scientific and technological innovation, 
uh, uh, they, especially as manifested in improved tools and machines, uh, brand new processes, uh, the output at all the different stages is multiplied, uh, I'm assuming by a factor of 10. Now we still have diminishing returns, but the returns diminish from a much higher point. We still have uh, differences in uh, degrees of quality of land and mines, but uh, uh, all of the absolute amounts are higher. Uh, they're diminishing from higher levels. Now I think uh, you can see this, uh, if you think about it, I think it's fairly obvious. Today, as a hundred years ago, uh, we have diminishing returns in agriculture and mining. But the point where we leave off today is uh, probably far, far higher than the point where people started a hundred years ago. The poorest lands and mines uh, in production today in a modern country are, you can be sure, far more productive than the very best such lands were a hundred years ago. So you just think of any uh, mining operation uh, in a first world country or probably in a country where uh, the companies of such a country are investing, uh, how much iron uh, would be extracted uh, by a hundred workers uh, in a day a hundred years ago? What would they be using to get the iron ore out? Probably shovels and, and, and axes. Uh, what would uh, workers be using today? A huge uh, steam shovels uh, lifting 100, 200 ton loads. Uh, so yes, there's still diminishing returns. Uh, if we attempt to bring in uh, two or three such pieces of equipment into the same mining sector, uh, there's going to be diminishing returns. Uh, just as there would be diminishing returns if we have too many men uh, with shovels in the same limited area. But uh, from where do the returns diminish today compared with then? From a radically higher level. And uh, it's very possible uh, to continue this process. Uh, what if we uh, reach a day, uh, which I don't think is uh, by any means uh, far-fetched, uh, instead of having uh, a worker uh, operating one of these uh, uh, bulldo one of these uh, steam shovels, uh, you might have a worker uh, in some uh, control hub uh, operating several such uh, units uh, through computers and fiber optics or whatever, uh, and, and various programs and uh, achieving still greater results. And certainly in agriculture, uh, what's happened uh, to the extent to which we need farmers? We need fewer of them. Uh, far, far fewer of them. Uh, what percentage of our population lived in agriculture uh, when the United States was founded, roughly in 1790? Anyone know? Yeah, on the order of 90%. Uh, what's the percentage today? Less than five, I think closer to three. And even that is more than we need because there are these uh, farm surpluses. Now, uh, what has happened uh, to the output of agricultural products uh, produced just by 3% of the population? Uh, what's the supply of agricultural products per capita uh, coming from the 3% compared to what used to come from the 90 percent. It's vastly greater, uh, much more varied, and the supply uh, of minerals the same way. So you just think, uh, what was one of the leading iron products of the 18th or 17th century? Uh, who, were, who were producing the iron products in those days? English. Uh, Pardon me? Well, blacksmiths. Blacksmiths. And a leading product would be uh, horseshoes, uh, some nails. Uh, the first, one of the early accomplishments of the Industrial Revolution in England was the very first iron bridge across some uh, relatively small river, uh, I think somewhere in northern England. Prior to that, there was no such thing as an iron bridge. Uh, Today, uh, what kind of iron do we have per capita? And various other materials that uh, 
didn't even exist in earlier days. Uh, think of the iron that, that you take for granted that uh, is in your automobile, uh, your, your appliances, or other metals. How much do we have per capita? And then the petrochemicals and so forth, which are of very recent origin. So we have uh, much more of these things uh, per capita. Okay, well, let me uh, go further. Uh, we'll go back uh, to the beginning. Uh, I give, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, under the heading Wealth and the Economic Problem, at uh, some point soon I want to discuss what I call the wealth-centeredness of economics. And I start off with a definition of wealth. I say it's material goods made by man. And we need to distinguish it from uh, other things uh, that are often confused with it, uh, like stocks, bonds, bank deposits. Uh, these are claims to wealth, uh, but they are not wealth it itself. Uh, wealth, as I say, is material goods made by man. It's automobiles, houses, steel mills, uh, bars of, uh, of copper. Uh, it's uh, wheat fields, tractors. Uh, it is not stocks and bonds or bank deposits. Stocks and bonds are claims to uh, physical assets, uh, such as factory buildings and their equipment, as are uh, bank deposits. Or they might be claims to houses and uh, the land sites on which the houses stand. Uh, licenses uh, have a market value, but they're not wealth. Uh, what does a license give you? Yeah, per permission uh, to engage in some activity. Now, uh, is that permission uh, a material good? I mean, what would happen if you didn't require the permission? What would happen uh, to the production of the actual goods uh, for which the permission is made a requirement? It would increase. So uh, a license, so far from being wealth, is actually, uh, actually represents a restriction on the production of wealth, a diminution. But the license uh, can have a substantial market value. Uh, in places like New York City, where you need a license uh, to operate a taxi cab cruising the streets for hire, uh, the license is worth a, su a, su a substantial multiple of the value of the cab. But the license is not wealth. The taxi cab is wealth. The license is not. The license uh, achieves an economic value uh, by virtue of uh, holding back the number of cabs and uh, inflating the uh, rates that can be received uh, for operating a cab. If you had uh, free competition, uh, the, you'd have uh, more cabs, lower fares, lower incomes uh, for cab drivers. Uh, there'd be no basis for the value of a license. The license derives its value from the extra uh, surplus income that the artificial scarcity makes it possible to earn. Now, I've said wealth is material goods made by man, uh, and then I try to explain goods, uh, economic goods specifically. Uh, these are uh, good. Th these are things. Uh, an economic good is a material thing that. Uh, meets a number of criteria simultaneously. Uh, before a thing can achieve the status of a good or wealth, uh, it first has to be recognized, it has to be recognized as having the power to serve a human need or want. That's one essential requirement. If something is not recognized as possessing such power, uh, it's not an economic good, it's not wealth. Now, why isn't it an economic good? Well, uh, does it, if, if its benefit does not come to us automatically, so there are some things whose benefit comes to us automatically. We don't have to take, make any effort or produce anything or take any steps. Uh, atmospheric air and sunlight, uh, these are things whose benefit comes to us without any uh, effort uh, or action on our part. 
Uh, we don't have to produce uh, sunlight. We don't have to produce the air we normally breathe. Uh, these things are called free goods, free goods. But economic goods are things that uh, do not come to us automatically, that uh, in order uh, to obtain their benefit, uh, we have to expend some kind of labor or effort. An essential requirement of a thing being an economic good uh, is that it requires the performance of labor or effort uh, to be enjoyed. Now, would we expend any labor or effort uh, on obtaining something whose benefit doesn't come to us automatically if we didn't recognize that it, that it would do us, that, would, that it would be a benefit to us? Would we go out and attempt to uh, achieve anything whose uh, benefit we didn't perceive if, it, if the benefit didn't come to us automatically? No. no. Okay, now, uh, so uh, things like the metals, uh, in distinction to the sun, to sunlight and atmospheric air, uh, the benefit of uh, iron ore and copper ore and things of that kind, that does not come to us automatically. Uh, before people uh, would take steps uh, to uh, acquire such things, they'd have to be aware of the benefits to be derived. And only when those benefits uh, began to be discovered uh, did things like iron and copper uh, become economic goods and wealth. Uh, to all of our Stone Age ancestors, none of the metals represented economic goods or wealth. None of these things were economic goods or wealth to the people of the Stone Ages. Much more recently, uh, does anyone know when, radi the, uh, when radium was discovered and its uh, useful properties discovered? Roughly, not the precise year, but... You know, actually, I think sometime in the, in the 1800s, a little before. Pardon me? Marie Curie? Yeah, Madame Curie. Yes, she's the discoverer of radium and its properties. Uh, uranium and its properties uh, were not discovered until sometime in the 20th century. Uh, now, was uh, radium an economic good uh, before its useful properties were discovered? No, no nor was uh, uranium. Uh, when were the useful properties of petroleum first discovered? Pardon me? Uh, sometime uh, in after the middle of the 19th century, in around 18, I think the first oil well was uh, around 1859. Yeah. So uh, prior to that time, people were aware of the existence of petroleum, but uh, they thought uh, all the, the, its only effect was to poison the drinking water of cattle. Uh, they saw no uh, useful properties of petroleum. It was only when it became recognized that you could use petroleum uh, to make kerosene. Now, maybe before that, uh, they were using it as axle grease. I don't know. I thought the first use uh, was kerosene. That was the first significant use. Uh, when it was realized that here's this uh, gunk that you can use to make kerosene, and kerosene uh, can be used to uh, as fuel for lanterns, uh, then uh, petroleum uh, began uh, to become an economic good, only for the first time. Uh, th there are other things that have become economic goods uh, even much more recently. Uh, uh, parts of the, uh, of, of the radio spectrum, or, or the whole of the, the, the radio wave spectrum. Uh, before radio was discovered, uh, was... Uh, uh, could we derive good uh, from uh, the radio wave spectrum? No. And there have been aspects of this uh, spectrum that have been discovered only very recently, and uh, one of the most recent fruits is uh, cell phones. Uh, they operate over a part of the spectrum, uh, and Wi-Fi uh, computers, uh, these are operating over parts of the spectrum that uh, until recently uh, were thought to be uh, useless. So. Uh, new uses can be discovered uh, for things, or uh, uses from scratch. Now, uh, in order uh, for a thing to be an economic good or wealth, as I say, it has to meet a number of requirements simultaneously. Uh, first off, uh, the most fundamental requirement, which I've mixed in with, with another, is that the thing actually possess properties. It actually has to possess 
properties of a kind that make it possible for it to serve a human need or want. It has to possess such properties. Then those properties need to be recognized. And its benefit uh, has to require the performance of labor or effort to be enjoyed. These are requirements. And then, on top of all that, we have to possess uh, sufficient command over the thing. We have to have it in our power, such that we can actually direct it to the satisfaction of a need or want. And finally, we have to be able to do that in a way that is gainful. Now, if a thing uh, does not meet all of these requirements at the same time, it is not yet an economic good and not yet wealth. Atmospheric air and sunlight, they're out because uh, they don't require labor or effort to be enjoyed. Uh, what about oil or uranium before their uses were discovered? No, they were not economic goods or wealth until their uses were discovered. Now what about something like iron on Mars? It's virtually certain there's a lot of iron on Mars. That's why it has uh, its red appearance that I, I believe is from rust, a lot of rust, iron oxide. And we know the useful properties of iron, but why isn't any of the iron up on Mars as yet an economic good or wealth? We don't have tower. Yeah, we have no access to it. It's totally beyond our reach. We're not in a position in which we can make the iron on Mars as yet do us any actual good. Now, even if uh, we get the ability to get uh, some of the iron back, and probably uh, one of the uh, missions in the not too distant future uh, will go out and come back with the uh, soil samples, well, uh, you still could not reasonably view uh, iron on Mars as an economic good if it costs a hundred billion dollars to send a spaceship up there and then it returns uh, with a few ounces of iron ore. Uh, why wouldn't uh, such iron ore uh, be in the category of an economic good uh, given the criteria I've listed? You don't uh, possess sufficient demand to make it, uh, make it turn into wealth. And we couldn't carry this on gainfully. We couldn't carry this on gainfully. If we're using up $100 billion worth of wealth uh, to gain $5 worth of wealth, are we uh, uh, creating wealth on net balance or consuming it? We'd be consuming it. Uh, this would not be a way of achieving our economic good. It might be justified on grounds of scientific research, but it would not be a wealth-creating activity. Uh, the same point would apply to desert land. If you've driven uh, between Los Angeles or Orange County and Las Vegas, uh, once you get uh, in the region of Barstow and beyond, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, empty desert land. Now, we have the technological knowledge uh, to make uh, any part of that land into highly productive farms. And what would you need to do that? We'd have to irrigate it. We might have to add uh, various trace chemicals. But uh, we certainly could do it if we wanted to. Would that be a wealth-creating activity, uh, given the fact that we presently have available vastly better land? Uh, do, you, do we need to irrigate the farmland in Illinois and Iowa and places like that? Uh, do we need to undergo other uh, costly preparation? No. So uh, if we were to... Uh, uh, utilize the potential of uh, the land around Barstow, it would mean either that we'd be withdrawing labor and capital from more productive lands elsewhere in the country, or we'd be uh, withdrawing labor and capital from other lines of production uh, where they're producing products that we want more than additional farm products. Uh, we would uh, be stepping up the production of farm products around Barstow in a way that caused us economic loss. We'd be producing less than we produce uh, by leaving that land barren. Now maybe in some future time, if we had a vastly larger population and we needed more agricultural land, then maybe we'd have to call that land into cultivation. And at that point, uh, it might be used gainfully uh, in, with a much larger population. But only then would it become an economic good and wealth. Uh, let me say a quick word about the uh, service industries. Uh, for quite a few years, 
a majority of the labor force has been employed in various service industries rather than in the direct production of physical goods. The direct wealth producing industries are manufacturing, uh, agriculture, mining, and construction. These are clearly producing uh, physical goods. But uh, the majority of the labor force uh, no longer works in these uh, four direct goods producing industries. Uh, the majority works in various service industries, uh, such as retailing, wholesaling, finance, insurance, advertising, uh, communications, uh, transportation, uh, repairs. And uh, on this basis, uh, it's uh, frequently or more often than not uh, concluded that economics is no longer a science uh, primarily concerned with the production of wealth because uh, more people are employed in producing services and that therefore it is now equally if not more uh, a subject that deals with the production of services. But I'd like to explain why I think that uh, uh, wealth is still the primary factor, goods are still the primary factor uh, rather than uh, services. Uh, by considering uh, the nature of these services, I think it becomes clear that uh, the great bulk of the services that are performed in the economic system uh, are performed as an auxiliary to the production or distribution of wealth. So you just think, uh, re here's retailing and, and wholesaling, major, major service industries. But what are the retailers and wholesalers retailing and wholesaling? goods. <coughs> the retailers are retailing goods. <coughs> the wholesalers are wholesaling goods. <coughs> so these are service industries, but they're service industries that are auxiliary uh, to the production of goods. They serve to bring the goods produced uh, to the various people who will use them. <coughs> now, what about uh, all of the services performed uh, in connection with repairs? Repairs are repairs of what? Goods. Uh, so that's another auxiliary to the production of goods. Uh, what about uh, insurance and finance? What is at least a major, major part of insurance? Insurance of, I would think, the great bulk of insurance, probably. The goods. Property insurance of one form or another. Uh, what is uh, most of the transportation system uh, used to transport? goods, uh, at least, uh, I don't know the precise percentage, but that's certainly huge. Uh, what about uh, 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 probably the bulk of communications, all of the communications going on uh, between business firms? That's communications with respect to goods or to services auxiliary to the production of goods. Uh, what about advertising? What is most advertising the advertising of? goods or services auxiliary uh, to their production. Uh, what is most uh, uh, finance activity uh, concerned with? The production of goods or the purchase of goods. Now, uh, there are uh, significant services uh, which are not merely auxiliary uh, to the production of goods. And these would be personal services, like personal medical services, personal legal services, uh, uh, personal uh, airline and train uh, transportation services, uh, taxi cab services, uh, grooming services, uh, legal services. Uh, these are uh, significant uh, branches of services uh, that cannot be subsumed uh, as uh, auxiliary uh, to the production of goods. And uh, they are uh, a necessary uh, aspect of economics. Economics certainly does uh, deal uh, with, these, uh, with these services too. But I would say that the perspective that brings them uh, under the heading of uh, treatment by economics is that uh, the production and sale of these services is the uh, means whereby the providers of them are enabled to acquire wealth that they are unable to purchase wealth. Uh, the fact that uh, barbers and beauticians uh, uh, 
can use the money they earn in barbering and uh, in uh, operating beauty parlors. Uh, uh, that money is what enables them uh, to buy uh, the various material goods they require. Now, uh, if we had, uh, if we consider services that do not have a substantial connection to goods, I would say economics does not study such services. Uh, can anyone think of services without a substantial connection to goods? Well, couldn't you describe a conversation between two people as a mutual rendition of service? But does economics study conversation? No. Uh, it studies services uh, insofar as the services are needed in the production of goods. It studies labor. Uh, that's required for the production of anything. It studies all of the services that are auxiliary uh, to the production of goods. And it studies those further uh, personal services that are the means whereby the providers are enabled to purchase goods. But when we get to services that have no such connection to goods, uh, I think they fall outside the purview of economics, like conversation. Yes? Um, so as far as jobs leaving the United States, uh -huh. and if I understand you right, then if jobs are leaving the United States and jobs are created here, a service oriented jobs, wealth would still continue to be produced because they are good related. For instance, uh, uh, jobs that are exported to China. Yeah. That are clothing. Clothing yeah. manufacturing. Yeah. Like Levi's. Uh -huh. If that job leaves, the job the wealth would still be created in the United States because it is a good oriented job. Is that correct? Well, uh, I wouldn't say uh, that the that the goods those goods would still be created in the United States because in your example they're uh, produced outside. But I would say that uh, these activities, any money-making activities that are going on in the United States, uh, whatever we're doing that enables us to buy goods, either that we produce here or that are produced anywhere in the world, uh, that still comes under the heading of economics. Now, but there's a separate uh, issue that you raise uh, in connection uh, with the loss of certain categories of, of industry uh, from the United States to outside the country. Uh, which could be considered uh, separately of any from anything I've said so far tonight. Uh, uh, there are industries that we've either lost or have lost significant chunks of uh, that would not have been necessary for us to lose. Uh, I don't know if I raised this uh, last week or, or two weeks ago or not. Uh, uh, in the United States today, we uh, import a substantial proportion of our automobiles. And I don't think we export all that many of them any longer. Uh, could anyone think of any, uh, anything that might be changed that would uh, enable the American automobile industry and also the American steel industry uh, to be much more competitive uh, at home and abroad? Uh, things that uh, hold these industries back uh, that are impositions on them uh, that they would not have to contend with if they had economic freedom. Well, you say emission controls, uh, possibly, but what about uh, more directly at the production end? The labor unions. See, uh, isn't it a widely complained of phenomenon, uh, the so-called Monday morning cars? Uh, many cars produced in the United States, it's alleged, are inferior if they happen to have been produced on a Monday morning. Why? Because it's alleged that uh, a substantial number of workers come in Monday morning uh, not prepared to work, or they don't show up Monday morning, uh, they've had too uh, zestful a weekend. Now. Uh, the automobile companies are not stupid. Uh, they know that this is a problem and it's costing them uh, market share and, and profits. Why don't they say uh, to their workers, especially in view of the fact 
that there are workers who either are unemployed or working in lower paid jobs elsewhere in the economy who could do the work of automobile workers, why don't they say, uh, we expect that anyone we employ will show up uh, promptly uh, at starting time Monday morning uh, in a condition able to work. And if you don't, then don't show up at all. Uh, your job will be given to someone else. Why don't they do that? That doesn't seem all that complicated. And if, if they did, uh, this problem would be overcome. Uh, the unions, they would have a, a bigger uh, problem with the unions uh, as they see it than uh, the, the benefits uh, from, from trying to do this. Uh, they have a, a long protracted strike that they end up, they might end up not even winning. So they don't do it. But uh, why do they have to deal with the unions? Why are the unions uh, able to be such a threat? Why can't a company simply say, uh, we no longer recognize this union. If this is what the union wants from us, if they want to deprive us of the ability to compete successfully, to hell with this union. We're not going to deal with them. They can shut down the labor for a period. But what allows them to do that? Because if there are other people able to do the job, why can't the company say, oh, we're just going to replace you? Laws. There are laws. There are laws. Uh, you'd be held guilty of some kind of unfair labor practice. Uh, you might end up being made to pay triple back pay and damages. Or you flat out wouldn't be allowed to do it. Uh, since 1935, uh, we've had legislation that compels employers, whether they want to or not, to deal with these labor unions. And since uh, 1932, I believe, uh, employers have been deprived of any kind of uh, legal protection against uh, intimidating mass picketing. You've probably all seen uh, newsreels of uh, a factory on strike. Uh, some people are trying to get to work, and there's a bunch of gorillas uh, working out, lifting the car up and down uh, as uh, uh, people are attempting to gain entrance. Well, uh, why should they be allowed to get away with such threats? Well, since 1932, the federal government has, and uh, 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 from about that time, or a little bit later, uh, practically all state and local governments too, have had a policy of turning their back on union violence and intimidation. They don't prosecute, except in, in the most egregious cases. If uh, a union uh, official or if uh, some union uh, goon uh, murders somebody, uh, maybe he'll be prosecuted. But uh, practically anything short of that, uh, uh, the, the police turn away. Uh, the district attorneys don't prosecute. So this is why uh, companies are compelled uh, to deal with unions, and it's why uh, the United States economy has unnecessarily suffered uh, internationally. And then uh, there are further factors uh, to the extent we have uh, other forms of government regulation that impose uh, higher costs on American firms. Uh, that puts them at a disadvantage, too. Just a comment. Uh, Pardon me? The U.S. may not be exporting automobiles, but they are exporting military equipment. They're, they're exporting what? They're exporting defense equipment. For example, F-16s, F-20s, you know. Uh, they're exporting uh, defense uh, yes, goods. Okay, the United States uh, armament industry apparently has some exports. Uh, we still export uh, airplanes. Uh, we export a large volume of television programs and probably uh, motion pictures, too. So there are certainly things uh, we still export. But we could have uh, uh, major exports uh, in manufacturing in such areas as uh, automobiles and steel uh, if uh, uh, our firms were not legally compelled to deal with unions that render them uh, much less efficient than they need to be. Yes, uh, Mr. Yes. Just a question. So, do other countries then not have uh, their form of a union? Do other countries uh, not have uh, their unions? Uh, there certainly are other countries that have uh, worse, more powerful unions than we do, uh, like France and, uh, and probably Germany. And then uh, there are countries uh, like Japan and Taiwan. They have, they have unions in Japan, but uh, the unions are practically all, as I understand, company unions. They're like aspects of the, uh, or uh, uh, branches of the personnel department. Uh, so uh, it's a very different situation. Yes? I thought unions are, 
or there to protect the workers and to help them have a decent wage and the way you're explaining it that it's actually harming the company instead of beneficial. Okay, uh, uh, her understanding is that unions are there uh, to protect the workers and achieve decent wages and conditions and so forth. Yeah, that is uh, what most people are educated to believe. Uh, that's what uh, uh, that's what you would uh, be brought up uh, going to school, uh, watching PBS, reading the uh, New York or LA Times and uh, Time magazine. But uh, uh, I'm sorry to uh, unsettle you. Uh, uh, economic theory has a, a different uh, perception on the effect of labor unions, and I assure you this is not just me. Uh, if you're aware of the principle uh, that other things being equal, the higher the price, the lower the quantity that people will purchase, the lower the quantity demanded. Well, what is the effect of all efforts uh, arbitrarily to jack up any price or wage on the amount of it that will be purchased? Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, what's the effect of all efforts to arbitrarily jack up any wage or price above the free market level? What is the effect on the quantity that people will purchase at an artificially higher price? It goes down. It goes down. And it's precisely in achieving above market wage rates that the unions cause unemployment. Now, you can have a union in a given uh, occupation. Let's say uh, we look just at a carpenter's union. Uh, you can have a carpenter's union uh, that achieves higher wage rates for carpenters. But in the process, it causes the employment of fewer carpenters. Now, uh, wh where do the people go who otherwise would have been carpenters uh, but uh, who can't find employment as carpenters. Suppose you wanted to be a carpenter, but uh, there's no demand for your services as a carpenter at the uh, union mandated level of carpenters' wage rates. You'll have to work in some other capacity, right? Who knows what you'll do? Different people will seek to do different things. Well, what is the effect on the supply of labor in other lines that the displaced carpenters go into? It's greater. Now, those additional workers can be absorbed in these other lines, but what's the effect, what would have to happen to absorb them in other lines, uh, given that there's now more such people? Instead of having as many carpenters as we would have, we have fewer carpenters and an overflow into other lines because the wage of the wage of the carpenters is artificially high. Well, in order for them to expand, in order for for more people to be employed in other lines, uh, what has to happen to the wage or price to step up the quantity demanded? The wage would have to go down. So, uh, what has been achieved by the carpenters' union? Well, they've gotten a higher wage for carpenters and higher costs of carpentry work and prices for uh, those goods, and they've caused lower wages in other lines. They've created an artificial inequality of wage rates. And exactly the same thing would apply uh, to fields restricted by licensing. So now, if you have uh, the unions controlling every field, if they could control every field, and they're setting wage rates artificially high across the board, then what happens? Then you have unemployment. Then you have unemployment. You have unemployment. And between uh, widespread unions, or unions, you see, the unions have the power uh, to influence wage rates far beyond the bounds of the unionized industries. One shouldn't think that the only places that unions can set wage rates are in the unionized fields. Uh, any uh, firm that wants to be sure to avoid being unionized, uh, what do they have to do uh, to keep their workers happy? They have to pay them wages uh, close to uh, what they could get belonging to a union. Uh, it's the lesser evil from the company's point of view. Uh, they pay the higher wage, 
but then they don't have to contend with the union's interference in work rules and further inefficiencies that could be imposed. So uh, the unions Im uh, impose their wage scales uh, far beyond the limits of the fields they directly control. And uh, to the extent they do this, uh, they're displacing workers from all these lines, causing them to crowd into other areas. And uh, to the extent these workers are more able, more intelligent, more capable, uh, they displace other workers who have to uh, move down. And uh, the whole uh, negative force accumulates at the bottom. And then if you have a minimum wage law, uh, you have unemployment. So there's this, again, this stems from the basic premise that any uh, ar uh, artificial laws imposed upon uh, those trying to create wealth is going to uh, decrease the health of the economy. Yes, so it'll be labor laws, uh, government government corruption, which prevents uh, free growth of the economy. Yeah. And uh, what about things like equal opportunity laws? How does that? Uh, equal opportunity laws. Okay, let me step back for a second and name the underlying principle. Uh, the reason why these, this interference has negative effects is either it's uh, forcibly preventing people from acting for their peaceful self-interest, stopping them from doing what would be beneficial to them and to the self-interest of those with whom they dealt, or compelling them to act against their self-interest. Now, uh, equal opportunity laws uh, I, I would say there's a, a lot of uh, fallaciousness here. Uh, the, the whole notion of an equal opportunity. Uh, they need, uh, uh, new com companies need new chief executives. I don't know when General Motors last needed a new president. Uh, sometimes in the years ahead, they'll need another new president. Uh, did I have an equal opportunity to be considered for that job? Did you have an equal opportunity? <clears throat> Should we have an equal opportunity? Who would have an opportunity to be considered uh, for the job of president of General Motors? Well, other CEOs, uh, senior vice presidents of General Motors, a very limited number of people. People who have, uh, ach have major achievements uh, which put them in the zone of possible consideration. Uh, the immense majority of people have no such opportunity. Now, this whole idea of equality of opportunity, see, this is a view of the world. It thinks that uh, they're like waiters going around with trays of opportunities. <laughs> and they're serving some people opportunities and not serving them to others. But if you think about the, the meaning of an opportunity, all that an opportunity means is an occasion on which successful action is possible. An occasion on which successful action is possible. And there are always such occasions. And uh, any time, if there's any skill you don't possess, but have it within your power to acquire, that's an opportunity. If there's any job that you are capable of doing that uh, an employer uh, would like to use you for, uh, that's an opportunity. Uh, if it's true that we have uh, virtually limitless needs and desires and labor is the uh, scarce element in production, then uh, basically there should be more opportunities uh, for performing labor than the labor we're able to perform. Our uh, basic question should be, which of the, of the opportunities are the best to exploit? <clears throat> now, the problem with opportunities is not lack of equality of opportunity, but lack of freedom of opportunity. What we want is the freedom to exploit the opportunities that are out there in the nature of reality. And as we exploit opportunities, uh, we then become qualified to exploit bigger, better opportunities. So you just think, uh, at one time, you had an opportunity to learn uh, arithmetic. Uh, some people, some students, didn't bother to exploit that opportunity very well. Uh, can they ever have the opportunity to learn algebra? If only after they mastered arithmetic. But unless you master arithmetic, you have no opportunity to learn algebra. And unless you master algebra, you have no opportunity to learn calculus. Well, it's very, very similar uh, in the business world. Uh, let's say you start out, your only opportunity is working as an assistant sweeper in some mill. 
Uh, that's uh, your only uh, job opportunity at the moment. But let's say you take it, uh, uh, you learn uh, that job, what it requires, uh, you establish a reputation as a reliable, uh, regular employee. Now maybe you'll have an opportunity uh, to be promoted to something a little bit higher. And then if you perform well uh, in that job, you have opportunities to go still further. You have to think of uh, the exploitation of opportunities as, uh, in effect, climbing the rungs of a ladder. Right. Okay, the more successfully you've exploited opportunities earlier in your life, the greater will be the range of opportunities uh, later in your life. And uh, this is why uh, there's always inequality of opportunity. The opportunities open to anyone at a given time depend on uh, what he's done with his life up to that point, as well as the external circumstances. And the idea of an equality of opportunity it ignores uh, what individuals have done with their life up to that time. It assumes that uh, the outcome, what happens to people, is the uh, automated product of external circumstances and their genes. And it ignores uh, all of the necessary self-development that has to go on. Now, actually, I have uh, a lengthy discussion of this in uh, Part B of Chapter 9 which we'll get to uh, sometime after the midterm. But uh, I think this is uh, an utterly invalid concept, uh, equality of opportunity. What you really want is the freedom of opportunity. Let people be free to exploit the best of the opportunities then available to them. And if they can do that, then they will almost certainly be in a position to exploit better opportunities later on because they will have gained something by the exploitation of the earlier opportunities. They'll confront newer opportunities with a better, more powerful uh, apparatus of skills. Yes, uh, Mr. Labor Union. Yeah. Would you agree that a large contributor to the failure of the major airlines over the past and the ones that are having issues with the labor concessions and Oh, would I agree that uh, the problem of many of the major airlines is the uh, union deals they have? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think there are some airlines that are, are non-union, am I correct, uh, that are doing just fine. Uh, but it's the unionized airlines. Now, uh, unions is a subject that we'll go into in greater detail uh, toward the very end of the term, uh, going into the economic history of things, uh, why the standard of living was in fact so low in the era before the unions, uh, how come uh, it rose over the same course of time as the unions. We'll see there's no connection between the unions and the improvement. Uh, they actually were working the other way. Uh, we'll explore that uh, fully. That'll be the last two weeks of the term. And I go into that material for anyone who can't stand the suspense uh, in uh, uh, chapters 11 and 14. So, okay. Now, uh, we've touched on uh, scarcity uh, to some extent. Uh, uh, I'm claiming that uh, no matter how abundant it may be, uh, wealth is always scarce in the sense that the need and desire uh, for, for still more wealth is, is there. The need and desire are always still greater, uh, no matter how much wealth we have. Uh, think of Bill Gates. Uh, another illustration, I think, a wider one, if uh, someone does not own an automobile and he's aware of automobiles, well, almost certainly he'd like to own one. If he owns one, he'd almost certainly like to own a newer, better one. If he owns several of the newest, best automobiles, then uh, the odds are very heavy he'd like a yacht or a plane. If he has a yacht and a plane, then he's very possibly going to be looking out for a yacht on which the plane can land. There is always uh, something uh, further. And I'll try to show uh, why this is not uh, accidental. Now, uh, I've said that uh, economics uh, is the science that studies the production of wealth uh, under a system of division of labor. And uh, I think implicitly, uh, economics is obliged to establish the importance of wealth. If wealth were an unimportant matter, if it were a trivial uh, secondary issue, uh, then the science that studies it in any fundamental way could not be any more important. If wealth were uh, a second-class uh, object of study, 
economics would be a second class subject. Uh, I don't think economics is a second class subject. I think it's a first class subject. And uh, to establish that, it's necessary to us to provide an objective uh, basis uh, for uh, the importance of wealth, uh, a, a f an objective foundation showing why we have a limitless need and desire for wealth. Now, our need for wealth is not limited uh, to our need for food, clothing, and shelter. Those are very important aspects of it. But our need for wealth extends to virtually every activity we, we uh, carry out, uh, such things uh, as art, uh, science, music, athletics, human relationships. Virtually every human activity without exception depends upon or is substantially facilitated uh, by the use of wealth adapted to it. And we'll take as our uh, first and last example before the break. Uh, think of the specific forms of wealth that contribute uh, to the activity music. What are uh, specific forms of wealth that contribute to music? Art. Me, instruments. All of the musical instruments, uh, violins, pianos, all venues. of the... Pardon me? Venues. Uh, ven to perform it. Yeah, uh, concert halls, uh, uh, s uh, symphony halls. Uh, how about, uh, pardon me? Radio. Radios, uh, phonographs, CD players, uh, music videos, uh, schools of music, books of music, the musical scores. Uh, all of these things are forms of wealth that contribute uh, to the activity music. Now, if we remove them all, what would be left of music? Suppose uh, we did not employ any uh, forms of wealth specifically adapted to music. You could still have some activity, but what would be the level of it? It would be the untrained singing, untrained singing and tapping. Because uh, to have trained singing, you need music schools, music teachers, uh, instruments, uh, timers, whatever. Uh, and also to a very small audience. If you want to have uh, Pavarotti uh, singing at the Colosseum in Rome or something and watched by a worldwide audience, uh, well, then you need uh, all of these uh, forms of wealth, uh, including things like uh, television and DVDs and all the rest. Uh, these are contributing. So there are activities that can exist at a certain level without uh, the employment of wealth, but virtually every activity is very substantially improved by the employment of wealth and can be more improved uh, by the employment of still more wealth. And we'll look at further examples uh, when we return in 25 minutes. So I hope you're finding uh, this material uh, from a different perspective. Uh, some of you may be very unhappy with it. Uh, that's my experience. And I'm sure I'll read all about it uh, at the end of the term when you write your evaluations. <laughs> Uh, there are many, many people who think that these ideas should just never uh, be presented uh, in a, a university classroom. Uh, they like dirty the carpet or something. And uh, certainly not have a whole term out of your 20 years of education uh, devoted to such heretical ideas. Okay, see you in 25 minutes.